over the last two years, Minecraft has started to come back in popularity after interest started to decline around 2013 and 2014. We can attribute part of this resurgence to the wildly popular Dream SMP, but it's more likely that due to the COVID pandemic, Minecraft was a nice, fun, and relaxing way to play with your friends during isolation. I don't know what I was doing with my hands there. And even though if you play on PC, you could buy a Minecraft Realm for $7.99 a month, chances are if you have an old PC lying around, it could make a pretty good little Minecraft server for you and your friends. More on that after the intro. First, before we talk about what requirements we'll need to turn your old PC into a Minecraft server, let's talk about software. Even though it's likely that your old PC runs an OS like Windows, that's not a good operating system for something like a dedicated Minecraft server, especially on older machines. If all you want to do is have your computer host a Minecraft server, then it makes no sense to hog up resources for things like a desktop GUI, background updates and tasks, and other meaningless things. And that's where MinOS comes in. MinOS is a Debian based operating system that is built from the ground up to host Minecraft servers the proper way. The best feature of MinOS is that it's headless so you access everything through a web UI. This has two main advantages. One, your computer won't have to waste resources rendering a full desktop GUI that won't be utilized 99% of the time. And two, you can access this web UI from any computer on the network. Also, since MinOS is Linux based, it can run on the oldest of hardware, within reason. I saw a user on the forum talking about how they were running on a server on a Core 2 Duo from 2006. I think it also had four gigs of DDR2 RAM. And the fact that you can run a simple survival server on a computer that has less RAM than my iPhone is a huge testament to how optimized MinOS is. Officially, there is no minimum or recommended requirements, but since it is 100% free, there's no harm in installing it and trying it out for yourselves. Now, the big downside to trying to run MinOS on its own is that it uses turnkey Linux, which is a very, very lightweight distro of Linux, even by Linux standards. And what this means is since the file size is so small, it doesn't include a lot of drivers for all the types of hardware that you might want to install it on. So personally, when I tried to install MinOS directly to my old gaming PC, it wasn't recognizing the network interface built into the motherboard. However, there is a really easy solution and that comes to us in the form of Ubuntu Server. Luckily, MinOS is also available as a package to download for Debian-based operating systems like Ubuntu. Ubuntu Server has a lot of the benefits that I talked about earlier, such as no desktop GUI, but it has a way wider range of hardware support for what you can install it on. And this is the route that I suggest that you guys go on. Let's briefly talk about the machine I'm going to be running Ubuntu Server on. It's my old gaming PC that I built in the spring of 2015. It's got an AMD FX 8350 8 core CPU, 16 gigabytes of DDR3 memory, 120 gigabyte SSD, and a GeForce GTX 750 Ti. Now, as I alluded to before, the GPU doesn't matter because we're not going to be using any sort of desktop GUI, but I need a GPU because my processor does not have onboard video. We're going to start by downloading a ubuntu server.iso file to flash onto a usb stick there are two main types of ubuntu server the lts version and the latest version lts stands for long time support and it's guaranteed to have software updates for a specified period of time the latest version of ubuntu server always has the latest features but won't get software updates for nearly as long it really doesn't matter if you choose the LTS version or the latest version, but I just say choose the latest version so we can take advantage of any new features that we might be able to. Once that's downloaded, we're going to turn to our trusted friend, Belina Etcher, to flash the ISO file onto a USB drive. I like Belina Etcher because it runs on the three major operating systems and also does a verification pass over the flash drive to try and catch any errors on the fly. This step can be quick or lengthy depending on the speed of your USB flash drive. Now we're going to install Ubuntu server on our machine. First plug in your USB drive, then go into your motherboard's BIOS or boot menu to boot off the installer. The 
Ubuntu Server Installer will guide you through setting up your username, password, and other settings. When getting to the part when the installer prompts you to install OpenSSH Server, say yes so we can get access to the terminal of our server remotely without needing to have a monitor or keyboard attached. Once you have gone through the rest of the installer and it has finished downloading and installing security updates, the server will reboot into a login prompt where you will enter the credentials of the user you set up during the installation process. Installing MinOS is very simple because they provide you a script that does all the work for you. So before we install anything, let's connect to our server via SSH, and that means we have to figure out the IP of our server. If you have access to your server with a monitor and keyboard, then you can install the NetTools package and run the ifconfig command to see what IP your router has assigned to your server. It's helpful to know this IP address because then you can go into your router's config menu and make sure that your router assigns the same IP to your server every time. If you no longer have access to your server, you could still go into your router's config and grab the IP of any new devices that have joined the network and see which one will connect via SSH. Once we know the IP of our computer, on Windows you can use the command prompt to access the server via SSH, but I prefer to use the Windows terminal that you can download from the Windows store. It looks a lot better than the default command prompt and it also has a tab system built in so that's why I like to use it. If you're on a Mac or Linux based computer then using the terminal is the best way to access a computer through SSH. We can request to connect to our server by typing the command SSH space username at IP so in this case I would type SSH chris at 192.168 0.137. Upon the first connection, your computer will ask if you want to trust the fingerprint of the server, which we do, and then boom, we're connected. Now installing MinOS itself is very simple because they give you a script that will do all the work for you automatically. Click on the link down in the description or go to the installation page on the MinOS wiki and copy the link address from the link that says wget friendly link. In a terminal, type wget and then right click to paste the link from the wiki and Ubuntu will download all required files for MinOS. If we list all the files, then we can see that the MinOS installation script is not executable. So to do this, we have to change the permissions of the file by typing the command chmod plus x install underscore MinOS dash node. Then we're going to type sudo dot slash install underscore MinOS dash node to run the installation script. After all that is done, you can run these two commands to start the server and stop the server, although the install script has configured the server to run automatically on boot, so you won't have to use them too often. This is where MinOS really shines. Creating a new vanilla Minecraft server or spigot server could not be easier than this workflow right here. First, access the MinOS web UI by going to https slash slash IP address colon 8443. Make sure to type HTTPS and the port number or else your computer won't know it's trying to request a web page from MinOS. When we hit the welcome screen, enter the credentials to the user that you made when you installed Ubuntu server. After that, MinOS welcomes us to the dashboard of our server. This acts as the command center of the OS so you can see overall what your server is doing at any given moment. The first thing we're going to do is set up a new vanilla Minecraft server by downloading the server.jar file. This can be done by going to the Profiles tab and clicking the download button on the server.jar you would like. As of recording this video, 1.17.1 is the latest release version of Minecraft, but you can also download the .jar of snapshot versions by changing the filter at the top. Now, as of Minecraft 1.17, Mojang requires that the server must have Java 16 installed, whereas beforehand, the minimum required version was Java 8. Currently, Ubuntu server comes with Java 11 by default, so we will have to install Java 16 via the command line. Now, if you're not running a 1.17 or later server, then you don't have to worry about this, but it's nice to know for the future. To install Java 16, I followed this amazing article by Linux Uprising to install Java 16 in under five minutes. Minutes. So make sure to go check the link in the description and check out their awesome work. If you're wondering when following their article, I chose the install and make Oracle JDK 
seen the default JDK version and had no problems after that. Once you have finished installing Java 16, we can go back to MinoS and finish making our first server. Hit the create a new server tab on the left to open the new server dialog. Name your server whatever you want without using spaces and special characters. Make sure that the box for this is an unconventional server is not checked. Leave the server port as is unless you have multiple Minecraft servers running on your network, in which case you will have to assign a unique server port to each server. The server IP will be the local IP of your machine, aka the IP we use to connect to it via SSH. Set max players, level name, seed, difficulty, game mode, level type as you please. Finally, I left enable query unchecked and generate structures checked and then hit the create new server button. Once it navigates you back to the dashboard, click on the hyperlink attached to your server name to set up a few more settings. On the left, select the Minecraft server version you downloaded earlier, so for me that's 1.17.1, and on the right, select the Minecraft server runnable jar. This is also the section where you can specify how much RAM you would like to allocate to the server. I would recommend at least one gigabyte of RAM for a vanilla Minecraft server that will host you and your friends. Since my server has 16 gigabytes of RAM, I'm going to allocate 4 gigabytes just to give it ample system memory. If you are running a Spigot server or another type of server that will also run plugins, then I would strongly recommend trying to allocate as much RAM as you can. Once all of that is set, we can hit the green start button and wait for the web UI to prompt us to accept the EULA. After that's done, we can run the server one more time to successfully start the server. If you go down to the logging tab on the left, you can see the console output from the server that may help you with any errors or troubleshooting. We can now launch Minecraft and connect to our server using its IP. And that's about it. That's how you set up MinoS, but if you want to port forward your server, there are plenty of videos about that on YouTube and it's pretty much the same process for MinoS or not. I think MinoS is a really cool way to manage multiple servers and to make use of an old computer and turn it into a Minecraft server. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please make sure to leave a like and leave a comment down below what you would like to see next. I'm Chris and we will see you guys next week.